I should be writing season 20, episode 11. Well, I should be writing. I should be working on my Hi there, welcome to I Should Be Writing. This is a podcast for wannabe fiction writers, and I'm your host, Mer Lafferty. Usually I have, uh, usually I'm solo, but I'm delighted to have an author on the show with me today. It is Scott Alexander Howard, author of The Other Valley, which is a lit fic slash science fiction speculative slash magical realism maybe slash book i have many questions to talk to you about genre actually but welcome to the show we're glad to have you thank you so much for having me um usually we talk about what we've usually i talk about what i've been up to just because the show's called i should be writing so i try to keep myself honest to be honest i'm still cleaning up after last week's vacation so i've kind of gotten everything all the fires that were on fire they're put out and Hopefully, I'll be able to get to writing tomorrow, but it hasn't been a good brain week. I will have to say that. Um, Scott, can you tell us what you're working on? And if you don't want to, that is absolutely cool. Oh, no, it's cool. I am working on my second book, and it's, I mean, I don't even know. I'm terrible at counting drafts. I find it mm-hmm. kind of arbitrary in, yeah. in terms of my my method. Um, and it's kind of confusing because it's this one's kind of coming out very differently than the first one did. Um, so whatever method of counting drafts I had established is now out the window too. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's coming along. Mm -hmm. This one is kind of forming in my head a lot more than on the page. Um, at least compared to the first book. Um, but that is what I'm doing sort of like, maybe I'm on the first draft, maybe I'm on the third. Yeah. My, Mm -hmm. my, the thing that, that frustrates me is when people don't, people ask you how long it takes you to write a book. That is such a nebulous question to me. It's like, first draft second draft thinking about it while i'm in the shower um rewriting i don't know i really don't so i I get you on the draft versions um my husband's a software engineer and he suggested i he just like set up a versioning system for me that engineers use and i've thought about it i've thought about taking him up on that but um if anybody in the chat or if you're listening later has any good news to share please let me know the yay button is up and uh primed and we love to hear good news and uh including rejections because rejections mean you're a working author so we cheer for that and uh i know our good friend pauline has good news but i don't know if she's here actually she usually doesn't watch in the afternoon does she anyway um we've had some sales in the uh discord community so that is excellent news But if anybody has any news, uh, let me know, and we will get started with that. I told you I'm having a bad brain day. (laughs) Sorry about this, Scott. Um, So... Oh, no, it's fine. You had... uh, This is your debut, and it's got, like, super fancy people blurbing it, and it's, it's, it's been optioned already, and that's just how exciting is that and how daunting is that as it be as it as your debut um it's weird because it's been i've had a long time to kind of get undaunted by it you know because publishing is so slow sure and so you know it's been finished and sold for you know uh, almost two years at this yeah. point um so i think that the excitement now is kind of like in the rearview mirror. I mean, I, I, then again, it just got published a few weeks ago, so there's a whole new flurry of that. But, um, but I think I've kind of slowly been the the frog in the boiling water with it, mm-hmm. and kind of gotten used to the um, a, a different pitch of life. That's <laughs> a little bit more busy and social than it had been. You know, I was very yeah. much like an isolated writer when I was doing this. I was working. Um, as a freelance copy editor this is just you know my life was just an inbox and uh like word files and um didn't have like a writing community so um once this 
started to take off, it's just been kind of interesting uh, on the social level to have so many more people like, you know, agents and editors and publicists and stuff in my life than there were before. I, I absolutely, I, I've talked about um, excitement fatigue because the one time I got to announce an option, they decided to announce it after they'd renewed it once. So I was about two years into the option and suddenly I took a nap and I woke up to a flurry of excitement and I'm like, what's going on? And they're like, they pointed me to the link that said this book had been optioned. And I'm like, right. I was excited about that about two years ago. <laughs> I just didn't yeah, tell I, anybody. It's a weird thing. Yeah, it was the same for me too. Like the the option happened or the deal closed only a few months after the book sold. And but that was, you know, again almost two years ago at this point. Mm -hmm. Um and it just got announced in in the trades, like I think in deadline a few weeks ago. Um so yeah, I had a similar experience. I think mine was also held up by the the writer's strike, you know, oh, everything yeah. was put on pause for that too. Yeah. And um yeah, so you, I, I'm curious to hear about your um, history with fiction because your uh, you came at it through a PhD in philosophy, and a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard, and you've worked on the relationship between memory, emotion, and literature. Um, has that is this the first time that's like blossomed into fiction, or do you have shorter things that we can look up? Um, there is nothing, I haven't published any fiction before this. Um, wow. But that, yeah, but it's not to say that I wasn't working on it, you know, like it was kind of basically my path is the kind of perverse one where fiction was the plan A when I was a kid and a teenager and for variety of reasons, sort of erroneously thinking that maybe academia was um, more stable and secure and um, that's actually not true of academia. It's very difficult to have a, have a career in it. Um, but I went into philosophy partly as a practical consideration, partly because I was, you know, obviously I was interested in it too, but that was sort of the deciding factor between trying to make it as a writer um, and trying to go into um, academia where I could uh, become a professor, hopefully. And then the work I was doing as a philosopher was always kind of sort of strange as far as the philosophical mainstream was concerned. I was doing stuff that was considered to be highly literary and I had a lot of philosophers would say like this isn't really philosophy you're kind of doing you know comparative literature or something like that and so i was kind of pursuing a this wobbly compromise in academia trying to sort of keep one foot within my you know my love of fiction my love of literature and still also you know meet the standards of of the philosophical mainstream which didn't really work you know i got like some uh i got some support from from philosophers you know i'm not gonna underplay it but i think it was still kind of like a it was going to be a sort of a strange lonely life for me as, as like a niche kind of cult interest in philosophy <laughs> and then as soon as i decided to give it up and just try writing the novel that i've been thinking about for years at that point um it's really kind of felt like much more like coming home you know it kind of clicked like ah this is what i should have been doing the whole time so from plan a to plan b to plan a again um later in life that's great um i'm very curious so are there books about philosophy uh, are there novels about philosophy that fit better than what they were critiquing you about or, or or were they saying it philosophy doesn't fit into novels at all which sounds weird because most philosophy i've heard is uh, you storytelling is used to explain it yeah i think that what i was kind of doing was uh, it's, such a, it's such a weird thing to think about in retrospect, but I was kind of mining um, the literary canon for examples. Um, you know, I would take like a haiku or something from Virginia Woolf and I would plunk it into a philosophical context where people were. So my, my, my field was basically the emotions. I worked on emotions and memory. And a lot of the philosophers who discuss emotions were talking about, you know, they would just sort of use like stick person examples of emotions. They're like, okay, so John fears a dog. Is the fear justified? Well, it depends if the dog is actually dangerous or not. You know, it's very kind of simple, dry ways of talking about, you know, the justification of emotions. Um, and I would sort of take these more um, poetic examples from To the Lighthouse or The Waves and say, okay, well, 
you can you can make this kind of discussion work when you talk when you're restricting it to stick person examples but what happens when you consider more full-fledged interesting emotions um that are you know undeniably there um that we all experience but uh but the philosophers weren't really engaging with and my my argument was that the philosophical discourse that we have that the, the apparatus that they've built in that field to talk about emotional justification was actually pretty poorly equipped to talk about the full range of emotions that we experience especially in literature um, so that was kind of the way i was talking about it and why it didn't really fit you know i think that because my because my conclusion was that philosophers were sort of doing this wrong um it's not surprising that i didn't get a job in philosophy <laughs> They're like, we, yeah we love that anyway next <laughs> that, that that's that's fair but isn't that what like new I, I i've never been in a real scientific thinking think tank kind of place but it just feels like i think this thing might be wrong let me study it and see what's going on isn't that how this everything moves forward it should be it ah. should be but it's <laughs> not not always i think that the and I, and I don't want to represent myself as so, you know such a huge rebel that i was going in there with this destructive agenda um and that people weren't ready for it or something like that. Like that's kind of a, a heroic narrative to put on just professional floundering. But I think that there was, there is an, there is a kernel of truth to that, that it wasn't entirely welcome. Um, which is ironic because, you know, Socrates was kind of a SHIT disturber as well. You know? yeah. <laughs> um, and not, not comparing myself to him or that stature, but I, I think that, you know, the, the foundations of the discipline are sort of in, um, showing how the ways we have of thinking about things are not always adequate to the topics and yet the professional the profession as it stands right now tends to be much more like positive and theory building in in, in its mentality rather than wanting to face that sometimes our, our theories kind of run aground um, just where things get interesting wow I, I wish you had been able to shake up philosophy a little bit more because i agree that the emotions are pretty powerful but uh, i'm glad you wrote this book because uh, I'm enjoying the hell out of it. Uh, do you want to give us the basic rundown of what it is? Thank you. Yeah, it's um, so the other valley. Um, it is a it's about a valley. It's, it takes place in a small town um, beside a lake in a valley. And the conceit is that um, across the mountains to the east, the same valley reappears, the same town reappears within it. Uh, but there it's 20 years in the future. And if you are to walk across the Western mountains, same thing, same town, except there it's 20 years in the past. And this goes on in either direction forever. Um, so it's a kind of time travel book where time travel is simply terrestrial ground travel. You know, you get to the past, the future just by walking there. There's no machine, there's no um, portal. Um, it's very kind of rustic and rudimentary. And in this world, travel is strictly prohibited um, except so there's you know there's like fences there's armed guards um, you're not allowed to cross the borders between these towns um, but there's kind of one exception which is um, if you are grieving you can petition sort of the municipal government um, for permission to leave and um, you can go to the past um, 20 years ago um, and you're escorted by armed guards once you get there the point is to be able to kind of take one last look at the person that you've lost who is dead in your town but is still alive and healthy in the town of the past. And once you're there, um, you um, you have to wear a mask. You're not allowed to be recognized. Um, you're not allowed to interact with this person. So they don't know who you are. They just see somebody in a mask at a distance. But you can stand there for a little while and watch them as a kind of consolation, you know, like a last viewing. Um, and some people find it consoling and some people don't. Um, but what catalyzes the story is there's a 16-year-old girl um, named Odile, who's very shy. She's standing beside her school one day, and she sees some of these visitors from the future in masks kind of hanging out near her school um, with their their um, police escort. Um, but she accidentally recognizes who they are. You know, somebody's mask comes up for a second. And that allows her to put together which one of her classmates they must be here to see, and thus which one of her classmates must be about to die. Um, and only Odile knows this fact, you know, she and the actual the municipal go government. So what she does with this secret foreknowledge kind of um, changes the course of her life, and we follow her into adulthood um, 20 years into the future. And Hey, everybody, I have a bit of embarrassing news. When we recorded this, Twitch decided to run an ad at this point. And what I did not realize was it also stopped recording at this point. They don't tell you that. So while in the future I'll be trying really hard to 
make sure we take a break when the ads come, there is a broken part here, and I'm sorry. Yeah, basically about, I, I think there's kind of a kernel of truth to all of those. And I, like when I was querying, because I was cold querying, I didn't have any you know connections or referrals. So uh, was, that was kind of when I really had to confront, how am I going to try to package this? Because um, I wrote it in sort of a blissful, like who cares mentality, like, oh, well, genre will sort itself out. And then I was like, oh, no, I have to. I have to actually package this for someone like who's giving this, you know, two seconds of their attention. Um, and so I think I tried to use comps to signify where it fit in the genre space. I think I called it literary speculative to some people and I, I called it sci-fi to more sort of sci-fi oriented agents. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think I said it was something like a, I was like, imagine an Elena, an Elena Ferrante narrator in a Ted Chiang world, you know, just oh, to wow. try to, bridge that like okay so we have like a very literary or upmarket kind of voice but we're not afraid of having like a sort of speculative world mm -hmm. yeah, yeah I, I think i think a lot of people worry a little too early about the genre um because i'm like you it's like the stuff that i just kind of wrote has always been more has always been better received than stuff i fret about all the little pieces before it's really time. But I mean, do, does your agent rep a lot of science fiction authors or do they do most, most more lit fic or? Um, yeah, more lit fic. And I mean, honestly, a lot of like uh, nonfiction as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we were kind of, I, w I was able to choose between, between two agents and um, I chose um, my agent partly because I think she was um, the most open to me writing in a variety of genres. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this one happens to be, ha has a speculative element or or whatever, any any number of those other descriptors we, we talked about. Whereas I think the new one is shaping up to be um, a little bit more of a real world setting. And, you know, I think that that's, that's a freedom that I really wanted to have. Yeah. So uh, can we talk about the agent hunt real quick? Sure. Um, you you sounded like you you were definitely not sounding like a debut there because you you knew what you had to ask the agent because um, I think how do you see my career turning out or are you open to X Y and Z in the future um, I think it's something not a lot of people focus on when they're thinking about their agents so did you interview them and uh, how was that process. Yeah, I think we, you know, we, you kind of interview each other. They're trying to make sure that you're not um, going to be a difficult author to work with, right. and uh, and um, I want to make sure that this is like the the person who's best positioned to sort of like sell my books down the road as well as now. Um, yeah, I mean, I I only knew to ask that because I was sort of obsessively reading online things about what to what to ask. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't have any great uh, career acumen. I was just getting it from like other people's YouTube videos. Like, okay, here's, here's what you do in the call. Um, and people always say like, Oh, when you're querying, you have to really do your research, you know? And I think that's, that's true, but ultimately there's, there's only so much research you can do, you know, it does become a numbers game. Yeah. Um, in terms of who you're sending it to. Um, but yeah, I, f I found querying to be kind of a, a daunting, depressing process. Like, like most people do, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, well, how'd you keep your get... how, did, how did you keep your spirits up while you were doing it? You know, I didn't. <laughs> this is the <laughs> short answer. I think my spirits are pretty down. Um, I think that I did it in batches. You know, I'd sort of send out like ten or twelve, and then I would wait for you know however long. I think it was kind of like a, a month and a half before I would sort of try again. And uh, between the first and the second batch, I really retooled the whole query letter, um, really shaved it down made it much more kind of character focused um, rather than it's, it, I know it's tough with speculative fiction because I think you have a, an, an extra burden, same with fantasy, anything that's not just realist, you know, you, all of us only have a certain amount of words, you yeah. know, you've got your 200 or 250, but anybody who's able to say like, yeah, mine is about this character in the real world. That's you save a lot of time. Whereas mine is like, okay, here's the world and here's the character and here's the story. Mm -hmm. Plus here's my comps and so forth. So there's an extra kind of burden I think that gets placed on you. Um, so I found that to be to be difficult, but once I kind of, I finally did get some some full manuscript requests about five months in, around like the kind of 
30 to 40 queries mark. Wow. Um, and yeah, it's interesting. I didn't get, so I'm Canadian um, or I'm a dual citizen, I'm Canadian American, but I, but I live here in Canada and um, I kind of thought my entryway might be through Canadian agents and there's, there's not very many of them cause it's a pretty small market. You know, it's a small, huge country with not a lot of people in it. Right. And so there's not a big pool of agents, especially once you kind of winnow it down to those who are looking for your kind of work and are open for queries at this time. Um, but I still got no attention from Canadian agents. Um, wow. uh, both, the off both the offers I had were from the States. So when you were, you did say you, you wrote this in a sort of blissed out way. What did you do to deal with the normal roadblocks we all suffer with writing? Either the there always seems to be a roadblock around 35,000 words where people are just like, nope, wait, this is all crap. And then they forget that every other time they wrote a book, it was crap at 35,000 words or just feeling like you've had too many rejections and it's time to quit. Like how, how did you, like if you, if you didn't keep your spirits up, how did you uh, continue to move on? I feel like my spirits were pretty okay during the writing process. In a way, I might have benefited from not having sent in, like I, I didn't have a bunch of rejections um, for short stories, for example, mm -hmm. or for previous novels. You know, I was writing this completely from scratch and there was really no, it, it was very abstract. You know, the idea of publication was like this kind of vague thing. Um, so I didn't have like a, a big emotional kind of, I don't know distraction from from those thoughts I guess but I think that just in terms of the intrinsic um, experience of writing and the difficulties that you hit at that midway point um, I don't know I th there was a lot of challenges with with the writing of the book um, I think that in in my book so in in the other valley there, it's kind of bifurcated into two parts and there's a big jump between the parts so at, in the first half um, Odile is 16. And the kind of time span we're looking at is quite short. You know, it's the, it's a pretty condensed, the first half of the book is condensed into a shorter amount of time. And then in the second half, we jump forward and she's um, 35, about to turn 36. And the, the time, the sort of like the pace changes, it kind of traverses a year um, rather than just a few weeks. Um, and that was a big challenge, I think. Just, again, it wasn't so much like a an emotional trial. It was just like a very sticky problem in terms of conceptualizing the book and trying to figure out you know basically I got used to the pace that the first half had you know it was very much like a daily kind of here's the experience of living in this world here's what she's going through and then when I realized that the second half um, I couldn't I couldn't use that same pace I had to figure out a, a, some other way of doing it and it took me a long time to sort of solve that practical problem of being like, okay, it's going to kind of go over four seasons for her. We're going to sort of jump into sort of one week per season roughly. And that way I can maintain that same intimacy where I'm talking about like, here's her daily life in, the, in these few days. So I can kind of keep that time compression, um, but also then kind of skip forward a few months. And in that way also canvas this, this larger, this larger time period for her. So a lot of practical problems, you know, and sort of, sort of trying to sustain, I think, the reader's interest um, over that seam in the middle of the book was also a challenge because I really sort of, I don't know if you saw The Wire. <laughs> um, it's a, you know, a show that really changed up its cast of characters right. to a large extent every season. And this book does that a little bit too. You know, the first half, I, for various reasons, I jettison a lot of the context, you know, and I think that some readers have said to me that they you know reach that halfway point and as soon as they see what's happening in the second half they're like oh no you know I, I miss i miss where i was why can't i get back there and that was a very deliberate choice i wanted the reader to sort of miss childhood in the same way that that uh, the character misses childhood i wanted that loss to be felt by the reader as well but there's still a challenge there in terms of okay if i'm really kind of hitting you in the gut here how do I keep you turning the pages? How do I kind of continue to reward the reader's attention um, when a lot of the emotional attachments have actually been um, taken away, at least for a little while? Um, so that was also a challenge. Um, and I, I think I tried to solve it by um, letting you in a lot more about, into the mechanics of the world. So in, in exchange for you know losing a bit of the social context that you were kind of ensconced in in the first half, 
you do now get to see a lot more of the way that this, the, the, the sort of the metaphysics of the world work, the politics and the laws of the world work. It's no longer through a child's perspective. So we can actually kind of get a bit more information and that sort of sustains you over that hump, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so how did your, your, I, I'm just still just fascinated by this, this background in philosophy and emotions. Um, how, how did it affect how you're, how you're writing it? Did you go, do you think you went back to your studies and everything to sort of give your, your, your book a sort of, oh, words are failing me now. Um, just an underlying foundation. I don't, yes and no. I think that when I left academia, I was pretty burnt out. And so I conceived of this as being very much like, you know, I didn't read philosophy for a few years after I left. I was just mm-hmm. like, I was so tired of it. I've been doing nothing but that for years and years and years. And um, so I sort of saw this book as this wonderful escape from that stuff. And then it's funny to see now how much of it is actually still there. You know, like yeah. I think I, you know, I, I, I was walking out the door and not looking back, but I think a lot of it was still kind of... Um, stuck to my shoe and so I think that I don't know the influence of philosophy on it I think stylistically maybe is is hopefully pretty modest because a lot of philosophers um, I had one professor who said philosophers write like dogs and I think that's maybe <laughs> generous to philosophers sometimes you know, there's some pretty bad writing that you have to put out and there's also some brilliant stylists but you know it's often not that's not the first kind of I think there's a certain kind of badge of honor within the discipline of being a bad writer I don't right. know why really um, so yeah, I think that it's kind of, it, sh- it shows that you're, and again, it's, there's some great writing. I'm not, I don't, I don't want to crap on philosophy too much, but there's some people who I think uh, they view you with suspicion if something is uh, is elegant. They liked, they, they kind of prize an aesthetic of ultra dry, dogged sort of logic, you know, like it's, it's just a style. So the kind of human readable stuff for people like me to understand, they would not appreciate no, it's like, at least in the kind of the in the upper echelons of the of the best journals, you know, in philosophy. There's sometimes, at least in analytic philosophy, um, yeah, I think it's really kind of supposed to be opaque to anybody, except if you if you've been kind of like really, really um, saturated in the field, um, so, and that's pretty normal. So philosophers are like tax lawyers and accountants they they <laughs> all the laws have to be really obscure so people like me can't figure it out and we need people like them <laughs> yeah i wonder if there, i mean i think this is true of academia in some ways that there is this uh in group out group mentality you know like i think that that's the reason i mean capitalism plays a role too but i think that you know yeah. it's a crime that journals are paywalled you know like this is all of us you know we pay taxes a lot of that money goes into higher education um, especially in Canada, where we have fewer um, private universities, um, all this money comes out of the people and into the uh, into the universities, and then it gets kind of sheltered there because you can't actually read the journals that people are who work there are publishing in because they are subscription only. And, you know, it, they try to charge you fifty bucks to read one article. You know, right. so I think there is def- definitely an element of kind of hoarding knowledge. Um, I think some of it is also less nefarious and more just kind of a byproduct of any very high level of professionalism where people are only kind of talking to each other and so they develop their own parlance um so maybe that's not like intentionally shutting people out so much as just they've evolved in this um in this niche and so they've kind of developed their own jargon that only they understand yeah well that's that's irritating (laughs) yeah i will say on the more positive side i think that uh the the stuff that's the most philosophical in my book um that i can recognize um is sort of stuff that i think is it's certainly not unique to this book you know i think a lot of sci-fi especially you know takes on these questions so i can sort of recognize there's a lot of writing about uh the nature of personal identity in philosophy and I think that that's something that, that sci-fi has really explored too. Right. So there's echoes of these kinds of thought experiments like, you know, okay, well, if you take this, these memories and put them into a different person, has that person, does that person survive in their new body or is this a whole new person? There's kinds of questions that are along those lines in this book, you know, not not, not, not that exact scenario, but still 
um, that are recognizably philosophical, but I think also have a, a long history within speculative fiction too. Yeah, the old Theseus's boat discussion. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, what what books have do you think have inspired you along this way? Because your your book it seems to do that magical thing of remind remind you of something and yet still feel unique, which is very difficult to do. So can, can you say well, if, if there were any books that, that inspired you? Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. I think that um, some of the books that inspired, so, I mean, I mentioned my, my little comp, so I, I definitely was mm -hmm. influenced by the Ferrante Neapolitan novels. I think that um, also the Ted Chiang stuff, you know, he's, he's so good because he's got this like marvelous economy. Yeah. Um, he's brilliant. And yeah, it's, it's so brilliant. And yet it's in addition to the brainy sort of satisfactions of it, it's almost always really heartfelt and kind of humanist. Um, and so that was an inspiration too. you know, like realizing that I could combine those things, that it wasn't just an either or between like a very, you know, like I think Borges is kind of similar to Chiang in some ways, but Borges, I think his, the rewards are purely intellectual for the most part, whereas Chiang sort of speaks to the, the heart and the head equally. Um, I think Ishiguru was a big influence. Um, you know, the sort of like Never Let Me Go has this elegiac but understated dystopia. That's something that was inspiring to me. Yeah, I um, saw that in, in a lot of the descriptions of your book. People use that as comps. Yeah, yeah. I certainly, uh, I don't mind that. I mean, it's just an honor to be, you know, in the same sentence as, as him. I think oh, he's yeah. just so good. Um, I think that Yoko Gawa's The Memory Police was sort of a book that I read mm. um, that was a bit of an... And it was something that I, I didn't read beforehand. I was reading it midway through writing. And so uh, you can't call it like a, an influence per se, but it was an aha moment where I was like, okay, this kind of world counts as literary. This sort of eerie tone that doesn't feel the need to over-explain itself. It just establishes this dream world that we then play out as, as as realism in a way that was also like okay i'm glad that someone else you know got away with this too mm -hmm. um Actually, yeah i mean i've got sorry, sorry. Go ahead. no you go i think something that i haven't talked about before is maybe like more of an unpredictable one but i, I think that like when i was writing it i thought a lot about marilyn robinson's housekeeping so that's her first her first novel from from ages ago um not so much about like the the tone of the plot, um, but simply because I come from pretty pretty close to there. So the this this book takes place, um, I think, in her, the town Fingerbone is is based on Sandpoint, Idaho, or something like that, and it's just across the border to the south from where I grew up. And it's a similar kind of weird ecosystem. You know, you've got a kind of very arid mountains, and then these like deep glacial lakes, um, and it was kind of inspiring to me that, you know, just fantastic literature could come out of the part of the world that I'm from because it's not, a, you know, I don't come from New York, so there's not like a ton of literary history to, to draw on and feel like I'm kind of standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, it was very much like an underrepresented, you know, geographical locale. Mm -hmm. um, so it was nice to, to realize that about her. Excellent. Well, this is your first book. Um is there i know it's kind of been a, a wild trip for you is there anything you wish someone would have told you um it's funny because this is sort of a book about the perils of foreknowledge yeah, <laughs> so that's <maybe>. true <laughs> i don't i think that like it's probably good that i was pretty ignorant going in um i think it would have been nice to like if i had had a crystal ball had i known that i would eventually find representation for it that would have saved me a lot of grief you know that would have saved me like a lot of self-doubt yeah you know i i do all of my all of my work basically other than the actual drafting i do in a just a all-purpose free writing file um it's just like a, a, a diary of both of my life and of the book and every day i start by writing in it and the the free writing file that starts the year that i sold this book um the first entry that i would see every time i open the file says I'm utterly convinced that the book is bad. <laughs> and that's a few months before, you know, I got an agent and the book sold and I got option, all these, you know, wonderful things. Um, but I was just utterly anywhere. And so I, it would have been nice to have had some kind of inkling of the future um, just to spare me that kind of, you know, 
those dark nights of the soul. Yeah. But as far as, yeah, the, the practicalities of things, I think it's just like, it's inevitably a learning process. Um, so that's, I guess that's the main foreknowledge I would, I would say. Well, excellent. We uh, have some questions popping up in the chat, so we're going to turn to that. Um, let's see, there's a lot of positive discussion. This book sounds like a mind breaker. Um, yeah, sorry, there was discussion about technical problems. I didn't see that. Whoops, sorry guys. I'm glad you got it worked out. Um, yeah, a lot of people interested in the book. Um, okay, uh, The Kids Are Asleep asks, would you say the location in your book functions as a character as well in terms of having a personality, maybe their own arc? Hmm. It certainly functions as an important feature of the book. I mean, the entire thing is based around landscape. The landscape is drawn um, from the landscape where I grew up, um, which is sort of the southern interior of British Columbia. I don't know that it has an arc per se. I think of it more in terms of a of a presence, you know, like I like to let the landscape intrude in the book as much as I possibly could. And in fact, in revisions, a lot of the work was paring down, like basically like trimming these hedges, you know, taking away a lot of the botanical kind of... <laughs> descriptions and like the the geographical descriptions that I sometimes went overboard with um so it's definitely a presence in the story um I wanted the the natural world to be always kind of um coming in from the perimeter of, of the uh, on, on each page um yeah um before we get to the corollary question I'm gonna go ahead and set up the giveaway um so if you want to win a copy of The Other Valley, go ahead and put um, exclamation point valley in the chat. And in uh, about five minutes, we will draw a um, draw a winner with the magic of the bot. So the corollary question was, how did the setting impact the characters and plot? Did they all come together or did one come after the other? Um, so the world came first in this case. I had this idea um, kind of out of nowhere. Um, yeah, as I described, the book is sort of about uh, grief in some ways. And I was, um, it was a, a few days before a friend of mine passed away. Um, it was, she was in hospice. So it was something that we were kind of waiting for. And I remember sitting at my table and suddenly having this image that felt random to me, to me at the time. It was just this endless sequence of repeating towns. I don't think the valleys existed yet, but that came pretty fast after that. Yeah, and the basic idea was just, okay, a physical landscape that is kind of eternity where every town is staggered by a certain amount of years. And I had that thought a few years before I had any thoughts about the characters of the stories. I was still a full-time academic. Um, it's super time consuming. So I didn't, uh, I'd, I would jot a note down about it. And every time I would come back to that idea, I'd think, oh, it's kind of cool. You know, I should maybe try to write that someday. Maybe it'll be a screenplay or something. Um, but I had that world for a long time before I started to seriously think about writing this as a novel. And when I did, I kind of, I would just write these little vignettes each day. Like I have a good sense of the world. I'm going to now, um, just explore one character for, you know, 500 words and just see what happens. Just try to meet somebody that I'm interested in, in, in following further. Um, and after a few of these, um, I found this girl who, was, you know, deathly shy, didn't talk to anybody, just stood, you know, beside the the wall of the school every day while everybody else was, you know, out there with their friends. And I, you know, I'm kind of just like a bird watcher outside of the story being like, okay, she looks interesting. I want to find out why she does this. You know, why doesn't she know anybody? What's her backstory? And so it kind of just went from there. Um, but yeah, it was definitely the the landscape and the the world was first in this case. Interesting. Coming up with, figuring out the first thing is always a challenge for me or, or usually figuring out which came first or which needs to come first, I suppose. Um, so the book you're working on now, is this a sequel or do you have any other plans for a sequel or other characters? Or are you going off on a completely new path? And I know a lot, not a lot of people like to talk about their works in progress. So give as much or little information as you feel comfortable. I think, um, so the, the second book is not a sequel. It's in a, it's not related to it. I think that, 
you know, with film and TV, a lot of things obviously have to go right for something to ever be made and for a thing that gets made to go on for another season. So this is, you know, extremely unlikely in the grand statistical scheme of things. But if the show got picked up um, that's based on the other valley, I do have ideas of where that story could go, mm -hmm. you know, and I think I'm, I'm kind of willing to sort of seed any sort of further unspooling of the action to kind of the the adaptation. At this point, I don't plan to write a, a sequel, but I can imagine sort of a sequel happening um, if the show was to go on. Um, I think as far as my new book goes, rather, I mean, rather than talk about the substance of it, um, I think I'm happy to talk about the challenges. Sure, of start please. Of writing about this stuff. I feel, so I, I saw, do you know the, the German writer um, Jenny Erpenbeck? No. Um, she, she's somebody who, uh, who I, I really admire. Um, it's a very kind of, it's a very idiosyncratic way of writing. Her voices are, are, are so interesting. Um, and I saw her at a festival a few months ago and I was kind of heartened to hear that she had the same problem that I do, which is that, uh, she says she starts every book like 50 times, you know, she's at the start of the book. She's like, okay, I'm going to start it this way. And she goes for a little bit and then she thinks, no, I've got to start it this way. And I kind of feel like I'm in, I'm sort of doing that same thing right now where I'm kind of always nibbling the edge of the cookie and not kind of chomping to the center of the cookie as quickly as I should be. I kind of continue to sort of rotate the cookie and nibble some more from the perimeter. Um, and at some point you do just have to kind of make a go of getting right to the meat of what you want to say. Um, just because even if it's bad, then you have something to kind of build off of and revise and rewrite, you know, like I'm just trying to, convince myself to go all the way through it because I've, I've rewritten starts to this so many times and I have so much of the arc already mapped out, but I, I kind of continue to not get to it. So that's the big challenge right now is just like, in a way, having written the first book, I now know how much work it is. And so my brain is telling me, oh, it'd be great if you could just save yourself the time and, and just write it really well for the first time rather than the very inefficient kind of method that I used the first time, which is to write it poorly and then write it a little bit less poorly. But I don't think there's a way of getting around that process. Um, so yeah, again, the perils of foreknowledge. I'm very sorry about that. I thought my, my kid would take care of it and turns out my kid's t taking a nap or trying to take a nap. Probably not anymore because the dog was yelling a lot. I'm very sorry. Yes. Hounds must be appeased. Um, a lot of people want to ask questions about your bird watching mentality, <laughs> um, but we're going to take a moment and pick the winner. Um, there, just that button. Who do we have? Foreigner. Congratulations, Foreigner. I will get the book of the other Valley out to you. Um, if you want to whisper or email me your address, where to send it. Uh, unfortunately it's not signed, but you know. You should follow Scott on book uh, book tour. Are you doing a book tour? Um, not really. No, okay. I'm. Yeah, you can find me online. I'm on Instagram um, at Scott Alexander Howard. Cool. And that's sort of the main place where I'm active. Well, excellent. Um, so yeah, the uh, the kids are asleep. Wants to know how many of these bird watched characters made it into the book. Hmm. Um, several. I it's it's been a while, so now I don't fully remember sure. the ones who who got killed off but uh um and some of them changed form but i would say that quite a lot of the original people in some way or another have have persisted to the final draft um who ended up in the, in the in the actual book um yeah so maybe of those original kind of of that original crop maybe like four and it's it's a it's a book with a fairly small cast of characters like there's a lot of side people but the main core is pretty small mm -hmm. um, well, I think we have reached the end of all my questions. If you in chat want to ask any more questions, ask them now. Who are, uh, what are you reading these days, Scott? Um, I'm reading right now uh, Martin McInnes in Ascension, mm -hmm. which is a big sci-fi book. Um, we share a, a British publisher, so I, I got sent a copy of that and I'm enjoying it. It's much more, um, my, I mean, the thing about my book is that it's like sci-fi without any sci in it. Like this, mm -hmm. there's really no, there's no scientific explanation or otherwise as to how this, um, how this world works. Um, the explanations are mostly um, about the politics of guarding these borders. So it's kind of interesting for me to read a, a very heavy sci-fi book in terms of the sci content. 
you know, it's like a lot of stuff about um, biology. Um, so yeah, it's been nice. Well, cool. Um, it looks like we are uh, done with the questions. Thank you so much for being on the show. Um, tell us again where to find you online, please. Yeah, it's uh, on Instagram. It's at Scott Alexander Howard. And my website is also just my name, scottalexanderhoward.com. Great. And uh, you guys know you can find me at um, merverse.com or mightymer at gmail.com. And I stream this show Tuesdays, Thursdays, 3 o'clock on twitch.tv slash mightymer. So uh, thank you, Scott. The book is The Other Valley, and it is excellent. I'm just... Had had trouble putting it down so I could do this interview, actually. So um, I think you guys will enjoy it. Um, and I'll see you guys next week. And until then, you should be writing. Thank you for listening to I Should Be Writing, the longest-running writing podcast in existence. This episode was made possible by the Fabulous, who support the podcast via Patreon or Substack. Join the Fabulous at patreon.com slash mightymer or mightymer.substack.com. Theme music provided by John Anilio, art provided by Numbers Ninja, and podcast hosting provided by Libsyn. This episode is released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 License. You can find all of my books and podcasts at merverse.com. <laughs>